everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at a really exciting conversation that we are going to have. Um, it's called Know Your Rights. When I first envisioned this club as uh, a competitive soccer club for low-income immigrant and refugee um, kids and communities, I first of all wanted to make it something where kids could come and get really high quality soccer, get great coaching, and get all of the aspects of playing this game at the highest level that they could um, that was affordable and accessible. That was first and primary. But secondly, I knew it was an opportunity for us to have resources and community support um, within the club because that's where people come together is within sport. And so I wanted PCFC to be a social change agent. I wanted us to be a part of that movement to um, really bring the support that many communities who are left out onto the margins of our society may need. And if they're already within our club, they have trust of us, they know we have their best interests in mind. And so they're gonna come to us first. And we've already seen that. So we've already been in the space of thinking about being more than just a soccer club. And we wanted to expand that into um, this conversation of knowing your rights because uh, knowledge and education is power. So I guess the first thing that I really want to talk about is, first off, do we have rights in this country? And um, the answer is we absolutely do. So the most important thing that we need to remember is that we've got the Fourth Amendment, we've got the Fifth Amendment, and we've got the Sixth Amendment. Often it's very easy to, to think we don't need to know our rights because I'm not doing anything wrong here. But let me tell you why I think it's important to exercise your rights no matter what. First is we know that especially for people who are black and brown and indigenous, sometimes the government violates our rights even when we're doing nothing wrong. And so when we know our rights, it empowers us to protect ourselves and hold our government officials accountable when they do something wrong to us. So the First Amendment protects your right to express yourself, to tell your the government, so people at school, um, like the principal or your teacher, the police, um, immigration and customs enforcement, uh, all sorts of different types of government officials, you can tell them you disagree with them. And that's protected by the First Amendment. You also have the right to record the police um, in public doing their jobs. When we're in public, uh, our First Amendment rights are really protected. So especially when you're in places like on the streets and in the si on the sidewalk, when we're in school, it's a lot more limited. So if you're being disruptive in school, the government may be able to, to control your speech a little bit more there, for example. So the Fourth Amendment protects us from government intruding into our bodies or into our spaces that are private. To do that, you can say, I don't consent to searches. Um, to do that, you could say, no, you cannot come into my house. Um, you can say, please don't touch me. What the Fifth Amendment gives us is a right to an attorney. So if for some reason the government, even if you're doing nothing wrong, the government takes you and you, you realize, hey, I don't think I'm free to leave right here. First you can ask, am I free to go? And if they say yes, it may be safest to and most protective of your rights to walk away at that point. If they say no um, and they start asking you questions, you absolutely have the right to ask to talk to an attorney, ask to talk to your parents too. Sometimes they may not let you talk to your parents, but you have the right to have support in those situations. When interacting with police, you mentioned you have the right to say, I'm gonna remain silent. How does that all interaction cooperation come to, together in the sense of, do I still have to take abuse I'm remaining silent, but what else do I need to be conscious of as I remain silent until my mom comes, my dad comes, my lawyer comes? The, the first thing to remember is, especially in Oregon, um, you don't actually have to tell the police your name. 
Um, from a practical perspective, sometimes when you're interacting with the police and they ask for your name or they ask for your ID, it can be helpful to provide that information to make that um, encounter go smoothly. But that's really where that obligation stops. If you're stopped, what's gonna be really important to ask the police, am I being detained? Am I free to go? That's the first thing that you need to check in with when you're um, having an interaction with the police. And I think what's really important for you to remember is um, if you're being detained or you're being taken into custody, um, that in here is when you want to invoke what we call invoke your um, Fifth Amendment right, your Fourth Amendment right and your Sixth Amendment right. If you're not free to go, then you tell the police, I am politely declining to answer your questions. I'm not answering your questions today. You also tell the police, I want a lawyer. And you also tell the police, I'm not consenting to any searches. And I think that's super important because that's something we hear in the community a lot. It's like, well, I'm, I'm being told by advocates to remain silent. But can you and Kelly speak actually about the importance of invoking your rights and, and specifically telling police officers mm -hmm. about rights in a moment of a stop and, and the implications that that has? If the police decide to accuse you of a crime or the district attorney decides to charge you with a crime um, by saying, I'm invoking my right to remain silent and I want a lawyer, the police are not allowed to question you any further. Once you tell them, I want a lawyer, they're not allowed to ask you any questions. When you say you have a right to an attorney on a stop on a criminal matter, you have a right to an attorney. On immigration issues, that is not the case. You are not afforded a free attorney. And that's concerning for multiple reasons, right? Immigration law is often viewed as uh, civil law. Because of that reason, we often, as immigrants, don't have the same level of protections within the immigration realm of law as we would in the criminal sense. When, when talking to a police officer, when talking to an ICE agent specifically, it's always still important to invoke your rights affirmatively um, and be prepared for those situations as well. Um, you know, if, if you're an immigrant, um, it's no it's no surprise that you have to plan ahead of time for all these types of interactions. Uh, but it's always important to have a um, a family plan, right? And so having a family plan of all the contacts that are necessary within a binder for your family and yourself to know, all the documents, the legal documents that are required for you to have, important to have them in one specific spot. Um, Many of our organizations like Latino Network, CALSAP, and Kuhn, they have Know Your Rights cards that you can carry as well so that you know what rights explicitly apply to when an immigration officer is stopping you. But what if, uh, let's say, for example, a Mexican passport or a matricula, what if those are the only documents that you, are, you have access to due to not being able to get a license or any other identification because of your immigration status? Um, are we still able to carry those documents with us um, at times when we get stopped and also provide that as identification? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that the carry your documents, if you have them, applies to folks that have legal status or lawful status, right? For instance, say I didn't have DACA and I just have my Mexican matricula with me, right? The complications that could happen from that, if I'm carrying it on a daily basis, my my uh, consular ID, is that um, if I am for whatever reason stopped by ICE at any for any point, right? They're asking me questions and I'm invoking my right to say, to not say anything, right? I'm, not, I'm gonna stay silent, I want an attorney. Um, I have an attorney retained and I'm, I'm gonna speak to my attorney before I say anything. I think that you can follow up and also say, I'd like to make um, a phone call to a lawyer and I'd like to make phone calls to my family. There are a couple important things to remember when, if and when you have the opportunity to call your family. Um, when you have the opportunity, you have a right to call a lawyer. When you, they give you the opportunity, the police are not allowed to listen to that phone call. However, when you go to call your family, um, the police do not have to give you privacy when you speak to your family. And so when you call them to let them know what's going on, it's really important to make sure that you don't talk about the facts of what happened because the police are listening um, and they're gonna write down anything that you say um, and they're gonna try to use that against you later. And so I think the most important thing um, 
uh, to really kind of keep in mind is when you're out and about in your normal life, you want to have a couple of phone numbers memorized in case you don't have access to your phone so that you can call your family. It could be um, kind of a, a first urge to want to call somebody in the moment where you're being detained or in the moment when you're being um, kind of confronted by law enforcement or interacting with law enforcement. Sometimes, especially if they're yelling, get your hands up, um, it may be unsafe to be reaching for a phone or something. A lot of times um, when you are having interactions with the police, um, tensions are really high and um, we've seen over and over and over again um, in our country that um, a lot of times police take action and think later. And I think that we've also seen over and over and over again in our country um, that police are not always held accountable for unreasonable uses of force. Uh, and so I think it's really important to um, focus on your own safety at the moment that you're having that interaction with the police. So if you see um, any police officer doing any, performing any official duty in public, you have a right to record all of it. As long as you're in a place where you have permission to be there, so you know, if you're on a public sidewalk and you're not trespassing on somebody's private property, you can record what's going on with those police. And it's really important to do so because when we see other people's rights being abused and, and we have the privilege to be in a space where our rights aren't being abused, us talking about our rights and doing the things that we have the right to do can protect the rights of other people. I think the best um, information that I can share with the public is absolutely, um, even if you believe that your arrest is unlawful, in order to protect yourself, absolutely do not resist that arrest. And it can be really helpful, um, especially if there are people around that you know are documenting, for you to actually say, I'm not resisting, I'm not resisting, I'm not resisting, I'm complying with you, I'm not resisting because a lot of times police will say, stop resisting, stop resisting, um, in order to essentially tag on another charge of resisting arrest, which is a crime in Oregon, but don't physically struggle. Um, it's one way to keep yourself safe, and it's another way to try to um, kind of set up a, something that we need to think about, a legal defense for you later, um, when you have people like Kelly and I who can look at your case and do our best to zealously advocate for you in court. It's just kind of with all the evidence that we are seeing videos, it's just kind of why are so many cops not being arrested, detained, charged, or even the, the process of investigation for shooting people of color. From a, a legal lawyer point of view, why well, is it happening? How does it how does it look in a different way in the future to make sure these things don't occur? Yeah, that's a really big why question that I may not be able to fully answer. There are so many systemic um, kind of legal things that we might think through. There's also a huge cultural problem that's built by things like training, built by things like movies, all the things that create our culture um, that glorifies police and um, demonizes black people or brown people. Um, and there, there's just such a cultural problem too that we need uh, to address. Um, we need people to think differently in that office and that's the much harder pr problem but I think it's such a still such an important answer to the why, why is this happening now. You know, one of the big things that we try to do in the advocacy realm, especially now and especially here in Oregon, as we're talking about changing state law on the use of force, changing the law on uh, intervening, uh, we've come also with with a mindset as advocates in that in that space. We need to stop working within that system too, right? Like we need to stop working within like this is what public safety means. And so what that means is that we need to invest and push for investments from the state level, from local levels on creating a table that allows our communities, specifically black and brown communities, to sit down and say, hey, what does this mean to us? Because we've been shut down from those conversations for a long time. The state capitol was not built for us. The local city hall was not built for us. Because as you say to Amir, if, if we don't do anything else, we're just going to see a repeat over and over again. 
I'm really specifically curious about, um, there's been people fired for all sorts of egregious things that have to do with their color of their skin, um, you know, all these things that can be quote unquote put as their, their workplace, um, they, they weren't doing their job well or all those things. So what does that mean for LGBTQ people out in the workplace who for as long as we can all remember have been afraid to be out, have been afraid to be who they are in the workplace. And now supposedly there's legal ramifications to say that that's okay. Um, but what does that really look like on the legal side? I'm really particularly curious about folks who are, are transgender or non-binary um, because there's so many things that can be thrown at those folks to say, you know, you're not wearing the appropriate clothing, you're not, you know, following suit with what we have as a um, culture here at the workplace. In Oregon, um, our non-discrimination laws protect us in places like the workplace. They protect us in what's called public accommodations, so think restaurants, bars. We have uh, statutes that protect us from being discriminated in school. And those protections apply regardless of your sexual orientation, your gender identity, your race, um, your disability status, all sorts of uh, different types of protections and, and people who are protected in Oregon. There's a federal law that prohibits discrimination in the, in the workplace or by your employer uh, based on sex. Um, that law has not changed. But what happened recently is that the Supreme Court said that sex includes when you're discriminated against because of your sexual orientation or when you're discriminated against because of your gender identity. Um, that's discrimination because of sex. I wanna thank you all for an incredible amount of time. And I think also for um, the folks who are watching this that are from communities who don't interact with the police very often and who consider themselves allies to communities of color. Um, this is also really important information to know um, so that you can be an active bystander and you can be, um, you know, an accomplice in, in a situation where that you see something happening and you don't have to stand back and say, I actually don't know what to do. This has actually given you a lot of information on, on what you can do. Um, and to step in and be a good ally.